Parker. Okay, we are going to talk about the insights. Well, wow. ah, you are still uh, in Berlin in the middle. <laughs> blue one. Blue one, blue one. Okay, perfect. We are going to talk about AIDS science and starting. This is our presentation shared with uh, Nandi, Natalia, and Isabel. So, Natalia and Isabel will, will give them the flow afterwards to explain their parts also. So, uh, let's see if this works. Mm -hmm. We need to do that with the mouse because otherwise they wouldn't see that. In... So, yeah. um, All right. So we're going to talk about systematic measurements, which are for what we call ecological approaches. Although Pepe is a little bit uh, <laughs> concerned about this because we say that also the oxygen utilization rate is an ecological approach. But basically, we we just define this because they are. They're measuring respiration at the short term, temporal, and spatial scales compared with the long term approaches. And there are a few of them um, Dominique and Mathieu have talked a lot about all this talk in vitro oxygen consumption, like uh, microwave bird means and of those and so on. Uh, Gerhard will talk a bit about single cell respiration also with this uh, red of sensor ring. And there is also one that they normally refer to, but I am a, uh, a bit reluctant about including this, which is the prokaryotic growth efficiency, which deals with, uh, with the sum of uh, prokaryotic production and the respiration. At the end, it's like a fish that is eating its own tail because you have to measure respiration. And then we have the enzymatic measurements, which are indirect measurements. So all these, in some way, they rely, many of them, on conversion factors. And this, I think, is the main problem of them. And some of them with uh, sample manipulation, like bottle effects, pressure effects, and so on. Let's start with ATS. The ATS is a technique that was developed by that Parker in the 70s, and it measures apparently potential respiration as any other enzymatic aside that work with a kind of Michael's maintain approach. So you have to add substrate at saturated levels. So what we are measuring here is uh, we are detecting the respiratory electron transfer activity in the like, Hydrogenases and cytochrome that control respiration. And all these enzymes are known as the respiratory electron transport system. So we are adding, we are measuring the activity at its maximum, the Vmax, because we are adding this substrate, this uh, paradigm substrate like NADH, NADPH, and also succinate. And at the end, we are using the INT, which is a version salt as a replacement of oxygen, as an electron acceptor that is reduced to IMT formation. So that's the ETS method. Um, Natalia is going to talk to you about another approach, which is uh, to, to look at, to quantify this uh, paradigm nucleotide, NADH and NADPH, to try to fit it to a more, let's say, in theory, realistic approach to re real actual respiration. And also, Isabel is going to talk about the INT reduction, which is using the natural substrates that are in the organs in nature to try to look at this reduction and try to also relate this to something more realistic to 
actual respiration, but we will see all the limitations of the methodologies. Okay, the ETS is a uh, is fast and sensitive method because uh, basically you can collect water, a few liters of water, filter them very fast, even you can prefiltrate them if you want. Uh, just fast grows in the samples and do the enzymatic assay later in the lab. So you can go to a cruise and you can collect a very large number of samples. And this allows in some way to map sonally and in depth the respiration or at least the potential respiration in the ocean. There is no other approach until now that allows to do this with so high resolution. It also avoids uh, bottom and pressure effects, but it yields potential rates. And this is really important what I have here highlighted in red. It depends, it needs to be, it needs to be uh, um, converted to actual rates using the ratio of respiration ETS. Any indirect measurements needs to be converted to actual rates. So at the end, what is really important is that the relationship between R and any other <laughs> indirect method, that regression is robust, is strong, and is universal, but for the surface ocean or for the deep ocean. And if it's not, we need to constrain the variability of this ratio. What we know about the variability of the RETS. Most of what we know is work done in the surface ocean, in the upper 200 meters. So this is a, a regression line here, which looks very robust. In fact, it is it's significant, but we are having here organisms from, these are natural communities, all of them, but they are from pure oligotrophic waters to highly eutrophic waters. So we have a range in biomass here. I know with the correlation is pretty well when you put a range in biomass. So that's a robust correlation in some way. But if you look at the details here, you may see that in some times, some local studies, there's no correlation between R and ETS. And in fact, I tried to level here this, this from experiment phase one and phase two that we did here with misocosmos. And what we saw is that when we was a fertilization experiment. So in the control, without any fertilization, we had the blue dots here, there's no correlation or there's no significant correlation. But when we increase this and it's dominated by phytoplankton, the correlation is pretty good and is very similar to the global correlation that was obtained by Nandi in, his, uh, in her PhD many, many years ago. It's from different, different oceanic regions from the Southern Ocean, the Gulf of California, North Sea, Mediterranean, Canary Island, many, many places. So this is quite important. We have to look for this correlation and try to see if we can use it to convert values from ETS, in this case, respiration. But is this correlation applied for the deep ocean? We almost don't have data for the deep ocean. And I will show you what we found on these two studies, at least published. But let's go to this uh, experiment that the group of Ted Parker, Kristen and co-workers did in the 80s, which is really interesting. They grew up, cultures, five different batch cultures of marine bacteria, and look at the variability in the RETS during the growth phase and during the senescent phase. So during the growth phase, the RETS was close to them. During the senescent phase, the ETS remained high and the respiration completely dropped out because they were not sufficient to, to, to respire to. So the variability was about an order magnitude there. How are the bacteria in the deep ocean? We don't know that. This study, the one of the current current, was done pretty close here 
in this region where it's a lot of organic material coming down and the bacterial activity was very, very high. We had other crops. If you go into this paper, you will see that we have proxies, even single cell, prokaryotic activity, uh, the abundance of high NA bacteria. So there were bulk bacteria very, very actively uh, uh, working there and acting there. And we got this RETS, I will show you how we, we, we got this. But this is uh, closer to the, to the one thread also giving some information that the bacteria was really active there. So this has some sense. If we go to this other paper where <laughs> from the group of Kara Kendall from Thomas Wayne and Carl and I were co-authors also, you can see that it was inferred, and it was for the deep ocean in the North Atlantic, it was inferred uh, an RETS plus to five which is very, very difficult to try to believe in or understand, basically, how the respiration can be five times higher than the EGS. And besides this, there's almost very little information. I will show you something that we have on polymer. But this is one of the things we need to, to understand, and we need to constrain. What's the variability of the RETS in the deep ocean? How we got the respiration, because one of the clues is how you measure respiration with oxygen consumption in the deep ocean. Because normally you need lung equations. And when you need lung equations, you have always bacteria growth inside the bottles. So what we did here is we did a time series and we checked for the growth of the abundance of the bacteria and the production of the bacteria. And we correlated that with the oxygen consumption. And we use those relationships to back a scale for the initial values. Because if you measure the endpoint here, obviously what you're having here inside the bottle is not exactly the same population that you had at the beginning at the start of the experiment. So you in some way need to back a scale to initial conditions. And obviously we think the respiration should be way higher. More recently, what we have done is using massive mass spectrometry in the Mediterranean cruise. And we did also time series with a small diet at this point. And we look at the respiration and calibrate it with EDS. And we got a value that is about 0.1, 0.1 in the Mediterranean Sea, which is obviously a very electrophic system. This is in published. In the past, many years ago, and I think this is the, the only compilation that we got <laughs> after 20 years ago, we compiled all the data we had from ETS and when tr we tried to make an estimate of the respiration in the global ocean. Well, this is very uh, ambitious to say because we extrapolated for the global ocean with the, with the meager data set that we have on, on ETS. But what we got here, and using a 0.1, which is like a lower threshold respiration, 0.1 ratio. And we got these values. And we compare this also with other estimates like the oxygen utilization rates that Pepe is going to talk to you about. And basically, with the seminar paper by Jenkins and co workers in the Saragasin City, in that area where they estimate by the first time the oxygen utilization rates in the ocean. And we also extrapolate it for the global ocean. And it's funny to see, or it's interesting, or it's challenging to see that the oxygen utilization rates and the EPS in the mesopelagic zone match pretty well. Not in the deep ocean, not in the vasopelagic zone, but just in the mesopelagic zone. So it's encouraging to see it. Some other studies more recent where we have compared EPS also with this. Uh, Tracer conservation model, which is based on climatological data on oxygen, disorder in organic carbon, and nitrate. Carry out at the stock station, which is a, a time series station that we have north of the Canary Islands here. It matched very, very well. Both elements <coughs> here the EPS and the trace conservation model. And this area is peculiar, the Canary Islands, because Compared to the bath station, which are more or less at the same latitude, 
the bus station, the Bermuda station is uh, has more production, is more like a seasonal productive cycle. So we have more, sorry, more sinking of particles compared to the Canary Island region where we have less sinking of particles, but more advection of particular organic matter or suspended particles from the coastal aqualine zone. So there are different sources. And in this case, a large part of the respiration is due to these particles that they are affected. So that's the difference in parts. Also, the ETS was used in the past to look at the dependence of the particles suspended in the water on the respiratory activity of the microbial communities. And this is also a paper that we did together with Gerker and, and some others, uh, following one of the is a Mid Atlantic Ridge cruise. And you can see the good correlation that it is between the EDS and the DO and the POC, not with the DOC. So that was one of the first, if not the first, study that really indicated a strong link, link between respiration and particles in the ocean. Also more recent studies in this region also comparing ETS with POC and DOC, which shows us that uh, <clears throat> DOC, sorry, POC explains about between 65 to 70% of the variance of the respiratory activity in the deep ocean. So these are the kind of stuff that we can do with ETS because we have this high resolution that you can see in depth and also spatially to try to look at these patterns of variability. Whether or not ETS is measuring actual respiration, we can translate that to a, a very, very rough values of actual respiration or not. And also in the past, like 20 years ago, <laughs> I feel too old to say this, but like 20 years ago, uh, we published this paper where we found peaks of ETS in the mesopelagic zone that were associated with relative maximum of DOC also that coincided with the deep scattering layer. Now, many, many projects now focus on the student and study this interaction between the scattering layer, the migrants, the excretion of DOC at these depths and the microbial activity. But when we send this paper for review, the reviewers say, wow, I never seen that before. We have all these DOC at deep layers, but I have to trust because you are using CRMs and so on and so on and so on. And they, I think this was, this is the kind of thing that we can do with the ETS. And this is my, my last slide, I'm going to show you also, this is from this Mediterranean group. You can see on the ETS here, the high resolution that we get and how we can see patterns of variability of respiratory activity in the dark ocean down to part of lake zone. And you can see how this match in some way with the POC or DON, all this maximum here is due to the, um, to the how do you say, to the, of um, exit of the water from the Red Sea into the Mediterranean, which brings a lot of organic matter, matter particular, or particularly POC, but not only, also DOC, PON, this is PON, so. And you can see this is this clear relationship between ETS and particles in the, in the ocean. So this is, uh, this is something that this is really interesting. And it, it looks like, uh, we need, we, we will talk a little bit at the end for the key messages that we can deliver from this talk. But I think this is one of the things which is really interesting is how we can use enzymatic approach in this case, the ETS to try to, to map and to try to do some or look at patterns of variability in the ocean, both in depth, but also sonally and try to compare with other estimates, particularly biochemical estimates. So Natalia, you have a clue?
Thanks, Javier. So we are going to keep talking about the ETS, but in this case, we are going to move a step forward because we are going to include the bisubstrate kinetics. This means that we are we are also moving from the basic scale that we have just seen to the individual or intracellular level. Okay, just to set the context. So as Javier said, the relationship between the respiration and the ETS holds its its has proved to be real strong. So it um, it spans from four to five orders of magnitudes it, um, of uh, in different or kind of organisms inside. But the thing is that when we move from the lab or from the organism level to the to the field, we have seen that even though the correlation is still strong, I mean they are both related, we have some variability in the ratios. This means that this precludes of using like a fixed uh, R to EPS ratio everywhere, right? Um, so there might be some factors contributing to this variability. Food quantity and quality might be one of the most studied ones and most proved, uh, but also species composition of the communities we are working on. And there might be some others that we don't really know about, such as pressure or oxygen concentration. So um, yeah. There are factors that are really affecting the, the values of the R2 ETS. Uh, in this case, I'm going to focus on the food availability, or the, the EKM focuses on this one. So when we talk about the uh, food availability at the intracellular level, it translates into substrate availability. So this is the ETS. I think this is the third time we are seeing the ETS, um, but it, this one is bigger. So uh, the ETS, uh, it has like four complexes and the substrate, uh, when we talk about the substrate of the ETS, it's the substrate for the first complex, which is where the electrons are donated, right? So um, the major substrate are the NADH and NADPH, pyridine nucleotides, uh, which they mainly come from the train cycle, from the catabolins, um yeah um at the end we, we have talked before uh, either carol and javier they have explained that what we do during the ets is to replace the oxygen as an electron acceptor we use the int so we will measure the, the production of formal okay and obviously the int or the formal and production are stoichiometrically related to the oxygen concept so um, in the EKM approach, we go like a step further, as I said, and we use a bisubstrate kinetics. This is not new. I mean, this goes back to Michaelis Menten, but the novelty of the approach is that we apply it to estimate respiration in marine organisms. Okay. So in 19, uh, you don't really see that, but I can, I remember that. It's, in 1996, Packard and et al., they suggest to apply this, this model to estimate uh, axon respiration, okay, in vivo respiration. So basically the model, what it uses is the VMAX, that is, it is denoted as a AETS, this would be the VMAX, the subset concentration of the ETS and some uh, kinetic constants, okay? So the, con the kinetic constants we are talking about are the half saturation constants, which are the KM for each of the substrate and the dissociation constant uh, of the ligands to the enzyme, okay? So they, um, yeah, they run an experiment, a short-term experiment for a few hours, a, a little bit more than a day, with Pseudomonas nautica. And what they did is just to follow the response in, in respiration and EDS during the exponential growth phase at the beginning of the experiment and during the senescence phase. So what, they, what we can see uh, um, at the beginning, it's just there is a discrepancy between the ETS and the respiration, right? Right in the top uh, panel in here. So um, we talk about food availability as a factor creating variability in the R to EPS ratio. So this proves to be one, right? So um, why do we have that? Because these two parameters have different response times. Okay, if we have followed this experiment, probably the ETS will have gone down and they will match at some point. But in here, we have a different R to ETS value because of the different response time of the ETS and the actual oxygen consumption. In a later study, uh, Bakar and Gomez, they using this same data set of pseudomonas, they, um, they 
apply the EQM to predict respiration, and they compare this prediction with the respiration predicted from the MTE. The MTE is a model that use, it's based on the metabolic theory of ecology, which, is, which uses biomass to predict uh, physiological rights, okay, in this case, respiration. So they, what they observe is that the EQM could predict the respiration during the senescent phase, as we saw before and in here, but not the MTE. And this is, again, because they have different response types. The biomass will shift um, not as fast as the oxygen consumption, okay, in short-term experiments. Again. This is another study where they, where they well, again, and Gonzalez uh, et al. They use another um, organism, this is Vibrio natriacans, and they did the same exercise. They compared the EKM with the, with the respiration predicted from the MTE, and they got the same result. So um, this is a pattern that seems to be um, constant, right? So, but we should keep in mind that all these studies so far, it, they were like more a uh, theoretical approach or a theoretical application of the EQM because they didn't really measure the substrate concentration in the organs. They modeled them. I mean, they, they knew the concentration they were adding of substrate. In this case, we call substrate the, the food they were providing to the cells. Uh, to the organism, so this one like, could be pyruvate or acetate, and they model the decrease in the NADH and NADPH concentrations, but they didn't really measure them, okay? So the next step in the application of the EQM was to measure this actually, <laughs> right? So this is what we did, and we developed, uh, well, we, have, we adapted a methodology to measure NADPH and NADH, and we conducted an experiment, um, or an starvation experiment, with two species of zooplankton, we had a protifer and a mycet. And this was a, also a short-term starvation experiment. So what we did, we measure NADH, NADPH, we measure the, the kinetic constant, and obviously we also measure the EDS. And uh, we applied the model, and in here you can see in the in, in black, the, the estimated respiration, and in white, the measured respiration. And apparently, uh, they match, okay? So they match during the starvation time, and this is a pulse. We provided some food to look at the recovery of the organism, and again, uh, yeah, they seem to match pretty well in both organisms. So uh, we were really happy with that. So <laughs> uh, during this same um, experiment, we wanted to compare um, the measured respiration in the x-axis here with the um, estimated respiration from the EQM in the left y-axis and the respiration calculated from the ETS values we measure and a fixed up to ETS ratio. Why? Because this is usually the way we, we apply the ETS in the field, right? We measure ETS and we apply like a fixed up to ETS ratio. So what we observe is that the relationship between the um, the respiration from the EQM and the actual respiration measure was better, which is in, in, in black in here, what, um, was better than the one um, we calculated from the EDS, okay? In both organisms. Um, obviously, we should keep in mind that this is only in the laboratory with, a with only certain species of zooplankton, so the next step would be if we want to the EQM to, to work in the field was to, to go to the field, right? So um, this is what we did. So in collaboration with Carol and, and Isabel, um, uh, Carol had a project, a remain project. So the idea was to compare the respiration measure from Winkler, from in vivo, uh, IMC, from the EQM, uh, as well as with the EDS, okay? So this was done during a cruise. The, during the AMT cruise along the, the um, Atlantic Ocean, which allow us to have like completely different um, uh, physical chemical conditions. So we cover a, a large range of potentially different uh, food uh, availability and quantity and um, quality conditions. Okay. So we are still working on this data set. So stay tuned if you are interested in the results. Um, but the good thing or the, yeah, the novelty of this result so far is that we measure for the, for the first time kinetic constant in, in the ocean and the pyridinucleotides concentration in marine bacterial plankton. So 
that by itself is interesting, right? So, um, how do we measure the EGM? We need ETS, like the classical regular assay of the ETS. We need to measure kinetic constants and we need to measure the pyridine nucleotide concentration. Okay? So, we are going to have like a brief overview on how it, each of them works and how it is done. So, the first thing we do to calculate the kinetic constant, we use like a linear board, uh, board transformation to, to get the result. So what we do is to use a combination of NADH and NADPH concentration, meaning Javier just said that when we measure EDS, it's a saturated levels of both substrate. Okay, so this will be our maximum concentration, and we will have a matrix of five by five concentration. Okay, meaning that we have twenty five concentration um, combination of concentration. Okay. Um, yeah, so the maximum one will resemble the ETS, and then the minimum concentration will be zero for each of the of the substrate. Okay. Afterwards, well, we run the the, the assay, and so we will we will get this nice uh, plot, and we will apply this double reticular type transformation. From this one, that's how we extract or we we infer the KIA, the dissociation constant, and the KM values for each of the for each of the substrate. Okay, no worries. This might be overwhelming. We will do that in the lab. So that's it. that will be fine. How do we measure pyridine nucleotides? It's uh, pretty similar to the ETS because it's also a spectrophotometric assay. It is based on the methodology by Wagner and Scott, but as I said, we need to modify to apply it to marine organisms. Um, it's a single extraction procedure and an enzyme cycling. So what we do in the spectrophotometer is to follow the formation of MTT for Masan. For the, INT, for the ETS, we use INT. In this case, we use another dye, it's MTT. Um, and the way we distinguish between the three, uh, the two components, the two yeah, uh, pre-denucleotides, is the enzyme we use at the beginning of the, of the enzyme cycle. In the case of the NADH, we use alcohol dehydrogenase. And in the NADPH, we use glucose phosphate dehydrogenase. Okay, this is the way to distinguish between the two of them. And then we use a, a calibration curve to, to infer the concentration we have in our samples. So, but as every method, we have pros and cons of the EGM. Not everything is that nice and funny. And so the good thing about the, the EGM is that it has proved to predict respiration um, better than, at some point than the ETS and, and the regular way of calculating respiration from the ETS. Again, this is under laboratory control condition with two species of zooplankton. So one should be cautious, but the idea is just to move forward and apply in the field. Um, so it, this is a methodology that might be applied or use when direct measurements are not feasible, like the EDS. Um, and the good thing though about, about the EGM over the EDS is that it will also provide information on the biochemical status of, of organisms. When we measure the KMs and we compare uh, the KMs, the values uh, in organisms from different with different characteristics, different uh, food availabilities, different food quantities, um, quality, sorry. So uh, this will give us uh, some additional information that we don't get with the EDS itself. And the same with the subset concentration. <laughs> the maybe disadvantage that might have this technique is, is that, well, that it has this technique, is that requires large water volumes because of the sensitivity sensitivity of the of the subject concentration and the KMs. For the KMs, we need we need to dilute the sample uh, more than for the EDS. Okay. So uh, it requires like like four to five times uh, the as much water as the EDS. So uh, that may be limiting when we go to the field and uh, where the water is like gold and precious. So but it yeah so that might be a limiting factor of applying the, the EGM. Uh, it is also more time consuming than the regular ETS because we need to measure the KMs and the substrate. And uh, probably the, the what uh, we, no, we do not know yes, it, yet is the variability of the kinetic constant and the variability in the substrate. 
concentration. We are just starting to, to yeah, get into this. So we only know about how we are affecting a couple of species. So the way to move forward, it would be to understand this variability because we don't really know if the temperature, species composition, pressure, oxygen, pH, whatever, may cause some variability in there, okay? And uh, obviously, uh, we do not have uh, mesopelagic data yet. So we have epipelagic data, but not mesopelagic. So yeah, that's what we have so far. And now, um, Isabel is going to talk to you about the in vivo INT method, about the rational application. Yes. So we have been seeing in vitro techniques, the EPL and the EPL. Now we pass to the in vivo. So the INT method used the same compound as the two previous techniques, but instead of taking all the filters we do to the lab and doing everything, you incubate on board. So I would not put the ETS by the third time today, because you know that, but that's the basic of the INT method. I want you to focus right now on the middle part of the slide because I couldn't do animation. So the INT method works uh, very easily in, in a way to explain, it turns from yellow <laughs> to red. So you spike your samples, and uh, the color is a uh, yellow, clear yellow, and it's soluble. And then when it gets reduced with everything that we have learned today, it turns into red. And then you can measure it effectively. And the main advantages of this uh, method is that it can measure something closer to respiration, not potential respiration. It has a relative high sensitivity, as Carol says, 10 times uh, more sensitive than Winkler. It can be done faster than Winkler because incubation in Winkler is uh, hours and INT can be done in minutes. But of course, it depends on how much perspiration you have in the water. Um, one of the main things that I love on INT is that allows uh, community size fractionation without prefiltration because you know that. Uh, previously, when people wanted to study bacterial respiration, they had to fractionate the sample with filters and they would be in different bottles. And here you have zooplankton, and here you have bacteria, no? And then so you split your community and you incubate them separately, which is not, not the uh, environment. But with the INT, you can incubate everything in one single bottle, and then after the finished incubation is when you fit. Um, allows a higher spatial resolution in time than Winkler because it requires less volume. We are talking about, uh, well, less volume than ETS and EKR. Um, we are talking about milliliters, not liters. Uh, methodologically and logistically simple because, uh, so, I don't know, uh, you don't need a liquid nitrogen or you could even bring the spectrophotometer to the ship and have the data analyzed it on board. Uh, but obviously, there are disadvantages and also unknowns. Um, the main disadvantage is the, is the INT is toxic. We know that. So INT has been used for medicine studies for very long, um, but it was only recently that it was applied to the water. So <laughs> we don't know the toxicity of each organism in the water, so they may die earlier or later. Um, another thing that we don't know if all the organisms take up INT, because we have made it in natural waters, you get that signal, but you really don't know if every single specimen is taking up INT. And another thing that we don't know if the INT can be reduced somewhere else apart from the EPS. So the theory uh, to use this uh, INT method is that it can measure respiration from zooplankton, zooplankton and bacteria separately. And the assumption that the, if we all know from the literature is that in eutrophic uh, waters, you will expect to have uh, that's a copper pot, that's a diatom, and that's a bacteria. So you should have more or less the same uh, percentage of respiration in eutrophic region, but then in non eutrophic regions, you will expect the bacteria to have much more representative respiration than the other two groups. <clears throat> and when the INT method was used and they were trying to plot 
what is the bacterial respiration uh, on the community, like trying to represent these two in eutrophic and oligotrophic areas. They found that surprisingly, bacterial respiration is about 30%, regardless of the region, which is something you would not expect. So that makes us to think if the bacteria are not the main respirer in the oligotrophic regions, then which one are the main respirer? Or there is maybe a methodological bias. So that has created a lot of debate. So you can find in the literature studies who support the INT, study who say no, it's toxic, you soon not use it. So it's something that is still in the debate. And to give you a summary picture, of course, there are much more literature. Um, I put here a timeline. And for example, uh, the first time that uh, INT was used in marine water was in 2019. And then in, in 2015, was strongly criticized because of the toxicity. But then in 2016, was used in mesopelagic waters. But uh, it was only used once since then, since 2016. Nobody else had used it again. So the results need to be validated. And then in 2019, uh, uh, empirical conversion was created similar to the one that uh, Javier was showing before, the R-ETS and R-IMT ratio with natural water from different places was also created. And the method was uh, in 2019, slightly later, was validated in eukaryote cultures. So we know that the eukaryotes takes up, uh, takes up IMT because we were saying we don't know if all the organisms take up INT, so we were doing experiments in the lab, and it seems like all type of the main eukaryote take it. And then in 2020, um, natural water samples in oligotrophic areas show high toxicity after five, 15 minutes, very quickly. And then nowadays, uh, we are working on the remain project. And one of the things we are doing is creating this RIMP ratio in surface waters. And we are testing, we test already the eukaryotes one, but now we are testing the RIMP in prokaryotes culture and check if all the prokaryotes take up IMT and their specific toxicity if there's any. And that's a summary of this uh, remain project, which uh, uh, Natalia mentioned before, is the one with the Atlantic transit. And uh, here we're using the method to estimate the, the platonic um, respiration, also fractionated. So we should have bigger than two between two and 0 0.8 and 0 0.8 and 0 0.1, which this fraction represent different groups. So we cannot say that Prokaryotic bacteria respire this, but whatever it was smaller than 0 0.8 respired this amount. And this uh, represents the experiment in the lab, and the paper is published, and that's the experiment in the lab with prokaryotes, and it's in prep. That one is also in prep. We also check if there is any reduction outside of the ETS. There are some um, papers to say that the, the DOM can reduce INT per se without any biology. And we did some experiments and we don't have evidence of uh, any reduction on the INT. And that's one slide of two <laughs> summary of the whole talk. And um, for example, in the first point, you say that the ETS is a, a fast and sensitive method, um, even more than INT and ECAM, but Again, if, if you have enough amount of water to play with, if not, I guess INT can be kind of sensitive only with meals. Um, we have the parts that we need this global R EPS ratio to be validated by doing the experiment uh, in the mesopelagic still. And um, again, more take messages like EKM and INT. Uh, they show something closer to respiration, or that's what we assume. And ETS is more like potential respiration. Um, we don't have, again, a global relationship for EKM and INT. Um, 
there is no information on these variabilities, so we're still working on that. So there, there isn't, but we are doing something right now <laughs> to try to find it, and we need more research. So I will welcome you to play with all the techniques and tell me more. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs>